But at the level of institutions, almost every few weeks, another high level statement calls for great in the Bretton Woods institutions, the WTO, the baby banks, bilateral loans, and so on. This coherence agenda means today support for the Doha World Program of the WTO, liberalization in goods, services, investment, trade related capacity building, improving global financial stability through capital account liberalization. Many of you would remember that this is precisely what went wrong in the Southeast Asian financial crisis, uh, the capital account liberalization. And channeling increased investment in developing countries and assisting borrower countries to coherence in their national policies. Um, Alan Winters, who was the director of the Bank's Development Research Group, uh, says that WTO and the Bretton Woods organizations are already rather highly coherent. All subscribe basically to the same model of society and the economy, favoring markets over time, advocating transparency and predictability, saying international trade and investment as routes to prosperity and peace, accepting the importance of development and poverty alleviation, and recognizing the possibility that adjustment is pain. Just pain. Hence, much of what these three bodies do is mutually support you and incoherence is mostly just a matter of detail. Besides shared commitment to neoliberalism, the WTO, IMF and World Bank have four models to achieve policy coherence. The serial declaration on the contribution of the World Trade Organization to achieving greater coherence in global economic policy making in the Uruguay round 1994, it's part 3.2, urge the IMF, the World Bank, and the WTO to follow, and they quote, consistent and mutually supportive policies with a view to achieving greater coherence in global economic policy. This is expressed in various agreements, ministerial declarations, and decisions between these institutions. In May 2003, senior officials of the three institutions, including Managing Director Horst Koehler, WTO Director General Supachai Panish Pakari, and World Bank President James John met in Geneva under the of the WTO General Council to develop a common approach to global economic policies, which is now called the coherent. So there is a very well developed uh, tripartite coherent uh, between these three organizations. Um, the most part is that countries must join to be eligible for World Bank membership. So you can't have one other. You have, you have to be at both. The IMF and the World Bank collaborate and at many levels on assistance to countries and are involved in several joint The terms for their cooperation were set up in in concordant in 1980 to ensure effective collaboration areas where responsibilities overlap. While these terms have since been elaborated guidelines dealing with specific issues, an external review committee undertaking a comprehensive review of one bank collaboration, taking into account new or overlapping mandates in areas of the financial sector work. The committee recommends how the two organizations can continue to best meet the needs of the global community to efficient and effective cooperation. There are various uh, regular collaboration which I'll skip. Uh, but some of the joint initiatives are very important because they are the, they are the initiatives which, which they are using today as, as their frontline program. During the 1990s, the IMF and World together launched two major initiatives to help countries. In 1996, the introduced the heavily indebted poor HIPIC initiative. Use the external debt burdens of the most poor countries. It's very uh, peculiar because what you saw in Lydia, first you make the countries heavily, then you say we will have an initiative how to reduce their heavy, heavily debted condition, which is by further debts. And that's what HIPIC is all about. Like Bangladesh and Vietnam, the HIPIC countries where this initiative is available. And in 1999, the World Bank initiated the poverty reduction paper, PRSPs. It's an approach where a country, it's a country strategy for linking national policy 
donor support and the development of needed to reduce poverty. It is the most uh, um, structurally adjustment policy that they are pursuing because it leaves nothing uh, available for the country to do its own. The PRSP defines how we must proceed. Uh, PRSP underpinned the HIPIC initiative and concessional lending by the IMF. That's the carrot, that if you, if you get PRSPs or HIPIC, you will have lending from the IMF. In July 2004, the the Global Monitoring Report. This is the coherence between the IMF and the UN. A Global Monitoring Report is an element that assesses progress on policies in needed to achieve the UN Millennium Development Goals. The GMR also shows how well, how well countries, developed countries and the international institutions are contributing to the partnership and strategy to meet the MPs as re reaffirmed at the Montreal Conference in 2002. Um, they work with other institutions, um, capital account liberalization, is a very interesting formulation which now IMF is proposing, which is a violation of its own instruments of uh, where it was not asking for capital uh, liberalization. Uh, but I quote from Kamaljit Singh, who should have been here, IMF is not only IMF is not the only international organization promoting capital account liberalization. The World Bank too has had been encouraging liberalization of capital markets to at the International Finance Corporation. However, in the wake of the South <coughs> crisis, the World Bank along with ADB has some rethinking on its previous but the IMF continues to prescribe the of capital account. They work together on trade liberalization, they work together on privatization of basic essential services, which for reasons that is very difficult to think about. They have put in the Asian region the burden of that more on the ADB. It is ADB which is leading the privatization process much more here. Um, about the Millennium Development Goals, which they are monitoring through the GMR, the MDGs ignore structural issues of poverty, such as debt, unfair trade, and economic policies. Perhaps, it's unsurprising, they were essentially by ministers from OECD countries, no participation by governments from the let alone those most directly affected. The MDGs had no contribution from, from South countries. How exactly will governments finance primary health care and education while they are being forced to cut public expenditure and private services under neoliberal conditionalities of IFIs? No one knows. How can the more effort commercialize health care, water and education? How can even the rather modest goals of MDGs be achieved by any country in the group of neoliberalism, privatization? Slavery. The social development goals are little more than a whitewash of the continuing policies of structural adjustment and liberalization, policies which worsen poverty and stunt genuine development. I think this is the this is a point which most people tend to miss because we, we have a campaign in India, for example, for achieving MDG goals by, by um, NGOs. But the question is that the structural notion that goes into MD, MDGs. Uh, millennium de development goals in the social sectors cannot be met till the IFI regime of loans and structural adjustment continue. The two just can't go together. And this is something completely missed. <laughs>